Welcome to Ramdas Here and Now, and I'm Raghu Marcus, back again. I've got a talk today from May 1996, and what makes this super interesting uh, and timely, uh, the fact that uh, this came out of uh, the library and was pulled by Nathan, and... Uh, he remarked that uh, he, he made a, a remark. It might be a little bit slow getting going, but boy, does it come on like gangbusters. And he was completely right about that. Um, it's about integrating Eastern spirituality to the West is what uh, the actual topic he was asked to speak about that day. And uh, it turned out in the course of this, I'm listening to this. He said, oh, so I, he says, I was just hanging out with Tim Leary the day before in Los Angeles, Tim is dying and uh, he um, is taking his death uh, and using it as a celebration. And he talked about how unusual that that was and how Tim was downloading himself onto his Web page. And this is 1996. It's hard to believe how far back we're going now with the Web. Huh? And um, so... Uh, it brings an occasion up for me to say something about this wonderful new film called Dying to Know with Tim Leary and Ram Dass. Uh, and the film was done by Gay Dillingham. It just opened in the Bay Area. And I, I, I'm unprepared to, t to link you up, but Dying to Know, there, you just Google that up and you're going to find the film and see where it may be coming to your area and then eventually be available as a download or a DVD. Uh, I have seen it. It's a wonderful film. Of course, we did help out uh, somewhat with uh, the Ramdas stuff uh, and uh, uh, I highly recommend it. So that's my little commercial to everybody. In the, and this only came because I happened to be listening and he said, I was just hanging out with Tim Leary. It's amazing. Um, so one of the things he talks about here is the, the I remember him coming back from India the first time and talking about how he, you can't talk about gurus. You can't talk about devotion, surrender. There's all sorts of terms that are anathema to us in the West. And, uh, and you know, that's quite true all the way to today. Uh, but he says uh, that just the cultural difference... Uh, the ground, uh, the soil that these teachings from the East were planted he in here in the West. And he said, well, that soil wasn't that good in the very beginning. There was a lot of resistance. And you start with just the premises and the, the premise of uh, how the culture in India and the thousands of years of belief, for instance, in reincarnation. Let's start there. He talks about that and just that, just imagine that everybody, you grew up and it was absolutely part of like your hand that incarnation was, a, reincarnation was a reality and uh, how that is not in any way uh, common thinking and it certainly wasn't uh uh, at, at the time when, when Ram Dass came back, and if we just say that was a huge time of spiritual growth here in the West, and of course not to um, make little uh, of, uh, of Yogananda, for instance, coming at the turn of the century and, and introducing, introducing yoga, a uh, real concept of yoga here in, the, in America. Uh, but... Uh, here, the term, and he talks about this, the term guru uh, here is now synonymous with hustler, <laughs> right? So it's just a whole uh, a whole different atmosphere that this, um, that the teachings from the East have uh, blended in and, and we just have a, a certain Western uh, cultural habitual tendency that really... Um, really changes the way in which these teachings can be um, um, trans transferred here. Uh, one of them is, uh, this is, and this is a good thing, 
a, a great uh, example of this, uh, taking a Theravadan meditation from the East, and 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 it was made. Mm, yeah, this there's no absolutes, by the way, and you know I say this shit like uh, this is an absolute, and that this was happening hundred percent throughout, and and of course that's BS. It's just not true. But there were some cases, and there are cases where we take something uh, this pure Theravadan meditation tradition, Buddhist tradition, but particularly meditation, and it makes our way into it makes its way into the West as symptom alleviation. And that you know goes along with the, some of the self care, self help kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, that so he talks a lot about how this all of this gets integrated and what um, and and how we need to have a perspective that hopefully would in the end care for the original purity of uh, and and uh, uh, richness of the teachings that come from the east it needs a certain kind of care loving care that i think sometimes we don't give it and yoga of course being one example but how many people in in the west there's a yoga studio uh, on every corner and from uh, new york to main street uh and and that, and of course, that's not. There are so many people who have gotten so much uh, out of being turned on to not just hatha yoga, but yoga, the real yoga. Anyway, not to sermonize over that. Um, as he goes along here in this talk, he talks about seva, which he was part of, and the uh, gentleman who started the uh, eye operation clinics uh, I think, uh, in uh, southern India. And, and uh, that particular person, uh, his, uh, his guru was Sri Aurobindo and mother. And I first went to India, and those of you who have listened to the earliest podcast here on Ramdas Here and Now would remember uh, me talking about my experiences there, uh, which were quite profound. And uh, and he just mentions this thing that uh, Aurobindo was such an incredible uh, philosopher and uh, uh, wise, wise man. And one of the things that he said, and this is uh, Ramdas uh, uh, putting it in his own words, as you get out of the way, the higher energy starts to come through you and manifests as a spiritualizing of the earth. It's like tikkun olem in Judaism, bringing the spirit into life. This is so poetic. I love it. And uh, isn't that a lot about what we uh, can offer? And Ramdas talks about this. Um, this is when the talk gets really super, uh, as Nathan said. Um, and he talks about, aren't we lucky to realize the predicament we are in, to realize who we are and what the possibilities are for us? What I see is this circle that I use everything in my life as a vehicle to work on myself. I work on myself as an offering to others so I can become an instrument that does not create more suffering. So, uh, this is, if anybody is to, was to ask me what this is all about, that's what it's all about uh, in my uh, experience. And of course, Ramdas is a teacher, mentor, friend uh, that has certainly been something that he, he has transmitted to, to everybody that he's come into contact with from the moment he came back from India. And that is certainly the essence of his uh, incredible teachings over these decades. Great talk um, from Ram Das uh, from 1996, which is also, by the way, geez, I don't know how much uh, many months went by after this talk when he got that stroke. If you can imagine, it's, uh, it's going on 20 years. Uh, pretty amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing. So uh, thanks for the support, everybody. Please continue to do that. We need the support. We have uh, we have this beautiful uh, mindfulness meditation course going on 
now, free course, and uh, and and I want to thank everybody out there who has been supporting um, the continuation of us being able to offer these courses, uh, and by virtue of uh, using the donate button on Ramdas.org. So thank you very much. I mean, everything that we do is really hand in hand with uh, with our satsang. See you next week on Ramdas here and now. I was supposed to talk tonight <clears throat> about integrating and adapting Eastern stuff to West. And I think it's kind of interesting. I mean, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about it, actually. <laughs> I had a great moment. Um, a while back, I was invited to speak at a very Tony. Um, I, was, I was invited to help them raise money. I was doing a benefit at a very fancy place that had very fancy people. <laughs> and I came to speak as an after-dinner speaker. So the uh, woman who was in charge of the occasion called me and said, what did I plan to speak about? So I said, well, I mean, I hadn't thought about it till that moment, but I thought, well, I'm doing a book on conscious aging. I said, I'll speak about aging. She said, she was alarmed, she said, oh no. She said, nobody will come to a benefit if the topic is aging. What else can you talk about? So well, I'll talk about dying because that's a major thing that's happening. Her alarm grew. I said, well, I said, I just did some books on helping. We could talk about suffering. <laughs> So she vetoed, so I said, you make up the title. <laughs> so the title was Mining the Riches of Life. And I spoke about dying, aging, and suffering. <laughs> and it really split the audience. The ones that knew were delighted, the ones that didn't know were alarmed. One woman got up uh, and she said, you certainly have a dark view of the world, don't you? <laughs> uh, hmm. Win a few, lose a few. But I've, I've sort of been thinking about the soil onto which yoga came, or Eastern stuff came. And because uh, we're an interesting soil here in the West. Uh, pragmatic and uh, very um, well we're, we're what I'd call a non-traditional society which is interesting I mean because there's not a simple rule book to play by and um, in traditional societies there's great places for elders because they have to pass down the tradition in a non-traditional society they're obsolete And um, you're coming to a, I'll tell you how interesting if you push the edge of this society. Yesterday I was down in Los Angeles with my buddy Tim Leary. Now Tim is representing something so exquisite it's leaving me breathless. Okay. First of all, he's doing something for dying that hardly anybody else in the game is doing. He's turning it into a celebratory event which is something most of us are scared, scared to deal with. We're willing to turn it from something horrible into something, yes, you know, <laughs> something psychodynamically supportive. <laughs> and then the next one is to turn it into emptiness. I mean, what the hell's happening? Nothing's happening. You dying? Ha, huh, interesting. Is it fun? Yeah. yeah. Everybody takes it so seriously. You know, they think it was real. <laughs> See, there's that plane. But then Tim's taking it out another thing. He's just saying, let's celebrate the life process of dying, you know, and he's... And if you read an article in Time magazine last week, I really, for a, for a regular magazine to do this and do it not as a great put down, but as isn't this interesting sort of thing, this curious fellow doing this, because he now says that he is going to die on the internet, all right? <laughs> 
See, he's been doing two very interesting things. If you're a philosophical materialist in this culture, you want to figure out how to die that's interesting. So he's done two things. One is if we are information, he is downloading himself onto his web page. Right? So he has a whole staff of cyber folk typing away and copying into the machine boxes of files that stretch back 20 years. I mean, he's a collector, a real rat, collect, rat pack. And they're putting in all these incredible letters with Gerald Hurd and Aldous and this person and that poet and, and pictures and everything. So I, when I want to see Tim now, to the extent he's information after he leaves his body, I can just, you know, boot up, so to speak. <laughs> Boot me up, Tim. <laughs> now, just in case we are more than information, he's got a backup because then under those conditions we're the brain and he's having his brain put in liquid nitrogen. Cryonics, the cryo care company, I think it's called. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> So I said to Timothy, well, you know, I think you're, uh, I'm sure you're covering your bets, but I'll tell you, it's more interesting than that. I mean, I, you know, because the soul is, well, you know, you're yogis. So I said to him, but it's going to be interesting. I said, how the hell do I know? You know, it's all a mystery, but it's going to be interesting. One of us is going to turn out to be right, probably. And later, one of us will say to the other, see? <laughs> I told you, you were only your brain. <laughs> but what I saw was him playing out the funny myth of the culture that we are our material beings, that we are our material beings. And I think um, it's fun to, and my job was to merely see, is he suffering? You know, I mean, he's got every chemical. <laughs> it's listed in Newsweek and Time, you know. So many Dilaudid, so many. <laughs> he's not suffering. <laughs> Which is another celebratory thing, you know. Do you know that George Soros put up, he's that multi-billionaire. He put up $5 million to change medical attitudes towards the use of pain-killing medicines just to get them out of the moral stance that we can't have you becoming an addict on the very day before your death. <laughs> Isn't that bizarre? It is so bizarre. I mean, whether you want to or not, I'd stay as conscious as I could and take as little as I could. That's what I'd do, I think. <laughs> when I come times, who knows? So when I look at this society as soil into which the Eastern things came, uh, there are a lot of ways in which it didn't find such good soil at first. I mean, um, like in India, everybody just assumes reincarnation. Can you imagine having a whole culture in which everybody thinks that's true? I mean, it. you try using the word guru in the West. I mean, are you, which hustler are you talking about? It's become synonymous with hustler or with somebody putting on airs. Something like that. Or with somebody that means well. I mean, guru is a... a a teacher points the way. The guru's just like the door, the door jam. You look into the guru and you see your own truth. You see your own face. The guru's a perfect mirror. Shows you who you aren't. So you rent a guru to show you who you aren't until you cop to who you are and then you are the guru. There's only one of it to begin with. The guru knows that. The guru doesn't think you're real, only you think you're real. You're relatively real, I'll allow. 
I don't want to. I don't want to threaten you because. See, that's why I had three levels. Because people can't go from the egos directly into non-differentiated awareness. The Dzogchen people say you can, but I think it's hard. Because people don't want to let go of their separateness so fast. But here you've got a second try, you've got a second level, you've got soul. So you're still somebody. See, and you're more interesting than you were before when you thought you were somebody real or somebody special. So I go to India. When I went to Benares the first time, I had just come over from the States and I had my Western mind. And I came into Benares, which is the city of dying, and there were thousands of people walking through the streets on bony legs, not a bit of body weight other than just bones. They were walking bones with their loincloths, and tied on their loincloth was a little uh, pouch with the coins or rupees for the funeral wood for their fire. And they had begging bowls, some of them, and they were ulcerated or they had leprosy or they had cancer, whatever. And I was so freaked by that. I had my traveler's checks, you know, my hotel room, my visa, my American passport. I went home, I went back to the hotel and I hid under the bed. I was so upset by that. <clears throat> then I ended up meeting my guru and spending the winter in India and becoming um, India eyes. <laughs> whatever you do to me, whatever you do to somebody, whatever India does. And some months later now, I'm back in Benares. And now I understand Benares is the city where when you leave your body in Benares, you are free. It's, it's an incredible uh, yogic feat to have done this thing. So I'm feeling very different about these people now. So I'm not so freaked that I, I'm, I may have brought a lot of coins and I'm giving coins, and, but I'm not so freaked that I can't look into their eyes. Before I couldn't look into their eyes, it was, they were just symbolically too powerful for me. And now I look into their eyes and some of them are looking at me with pity. Imagine that. They're looking at me because I'm wandering around the world not knowing where I am. I'm like a hungry ghost from their point of view, you know. They know just where they are. Just where they are. Is this okay for you folks? I mean, are we here? Is it okay? I just want to check. See, I what happened was over the years after '68, um, I'd go to India almost every other year. And I'd go and I'd hang out with old Indians. The grandmas and the, the, and they'd sit around singing bhajan in the evening with no electricity, passing the harmonium and the tablas around, smoking chillum and just singing into the night in this village. With broken teeth and they, some of them couldn't sing on key and who cared? It was so spiritually precious. Then I'd come back to the States and the people I'd hang out with would be somewhere between 15 and 25 or 30. The old people weren't the least bit interested in anything that I had found in India. And in India, the young people all wanted to talk to me about MIT and how soon they could get here. And I felt like it was a huge serpent 
that was going down and coming up, an evolutionary serpent. And now the next level of person who could spiritually use what was available would probably be born in Brooklyn. As she thinks she was. <laughs> but you wrote about that already. <laughs> The yoga journal's not going to get home free, believe me. And uh, this is a Christian country. I mean, we can all stay, but it's, it's a Christian country. And, and therefore, a Hinbuju like me has a, is, you know, hanging on by my nails. Huh. And so a lot of what the East represented was threatening. It's threatening if you are trying to live by a set of beliefs. Because beliefs don't keep you warm on a cold night. It's got to be beyond belief. It's got to be faith. It's got to be direct experience. It's got to be, yeah. I believe in, if that's a mind thought, believe me, when you're dying, mind the thoughts <laughs> go awry, if not before. Hmm. It's interesting, in writing this book on conscious aging, trying to write about losing your mind, the fear of losing your mind, since I haven't... <laughs> what was I saying? <laughs> There's a great um, uh, film that the uh, Alzheimer's Society puts out. Do they generally around the country? I, I think many of you saw it. It was a uh, uh, Oscar nominee, wasn't it, as a documentary? It was called um, Diary of a Dutiful Daughter. Huh? Complaints, Complaints of a Dutiful Daughter. Uh, absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. It's a... Um, the mother is a um, intellectual, liberal probably communist, old communist, married to a professor, who starts to um, lose her marbles. And her daughter, who is a lesbian in San Francisco, I gather, moves the mother out to be there with her. And there, she's in a separate apartment. And slowly the mother is kind of um, writing down a hundred notes to remind herself to go to the dentist and things like that. And the daughter is freaking. And the, the mother gets to the point where she's saying to the daughter, so you tell me you're, you're my daughter. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and the daughter is freaking. You know I, you know. And then the daughter gets the message. She realizes that the person that's suffering in this whole situation is her. And she's suffering because she's trying to make believe, she's trying to make her mother who she was, but that isn't who she is. And so the daughter lets go and goes with it, like, yeah, isn't it interesting that I'm your daughter? You know, and said, you, you know. And the, 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 the wild part of that film, from my point of view, is that after she can't any longer be in her apartment because she can't keep this level of plane of consciousness together enough to keep it together, the daughter with much shrieking and all this finds a way to finds a nursing home for Alzheimer's people. And the mother goes there and you go through the whole thing you have about nursing homes and all that stuff and the nursing home director says to the daughter just leave your mother, don't leave any of her belongings here. Like no pictures, no nothing. And that goes so against the grain of the Western consciousness. And the next day, the daughter comes back, and there's the mother in some man's gym suit. She never wore a gym suit in her life, you know. And she's got a pocketbook with a penny in it. And she is radiantly happy, obviously. 
And the daughter looks at her and, and the mother says, the mother's walking down the hall saying, I'm free, I'm free. You know, now, when you play with planes of consciousness, the whole business of mental health and kundalini and yogic changes of consciousness, that interplay becomes, that's part of the interface of the East and the West. I mean, that's a real part of it that most of the people who are saints in India would be hospitalized in the West. <laughs> because there's no superstructure to support them being nuts. Ananda Mai, she was doing cartwheels in her yard, this very dignified Bengali woman. <laughs> I mean, and they didn't say, oh, she's lost it. Her husband became her first devotee. It was a great moment. That just reminded me of a great moment. Um, I have a brother who has had a lot of mental difficulties. And one of the difficulties was that he decided he was Christ. And so, <laughs> as Christ, I mean, it, you may not think it is a difficulty, but I'll show you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, as, a, as Christ, he stole things. And so, <laughs> because he needed them. And he got put into... Um, a mental hospital. Actually, my father had him put in the mental hospital. When my father found him sitting there in a yogic posture, naked, with eight elderly ladies around him, <laughs> worshipping him, and my brother was burning his money and his credit cards. So I said to my father, what was it? that made you put her in the mental hospital. I mean, which of those things, you know, all of the above or? <laughs> so, so now he's in a mental hospital and the, the psychiatrist has left orders. He's not to see anybody unless, I'm, unless the psychiatrist is present. So I come to visit my brother. I am in my dress <laughs> with my beads, with my beard. My brother is in a blue serge suit with a tie, okay? The psychiatrist is in his white coat with his clipboard. And this is the cast of characters in this small little drama we're playing out. So my brother and I are having a discussion about the psychiatrist. We're, 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 we're reflecting upon whether he will ever know he's God. And the psychiatrist who's writing. <laughs> and then my brother says to me, I don't understand it. He said, in a few minutes, they're going to let you out. <laughs> I said, well, Leonard, you're Christ. He said, yes. I said, well, I'm Christ too. He said, no, you don't understand. I said, that's why they're locking you up. <laughs> it's really interesting. The minute you tell somebody they aren't it, watch out. Watch out. The minute you try to leverage yogic stuff for power, anything, personal power, boy, oh boy, don't smell the flowers too long. My guru was a very down-to-earth person, and what he said about Siddhi's spiritual powers were very simple. He said, Siddhis are pig shit. <laughs> Isn't that far out? And yet, Siddhis poured out of him. Isn't that funny? Yeah. We were singing to Nityananda a little while ago, and I was just thinking of the Nityananda that, I mean, Nityananda is eternally blissful, but I was just thinking of Muktananda's guru, Nityananda, who was a really far out Baba. I mean, he was out there. 
he stayed in a tree for seven years, uh, you know, throwing leaves down and stuff. And this is the great, I love the, this outrageous story. Um, Nityanand is having some roads built by workmen to various villages. And he tells them, at the end of the day, go home. And on your way home, any rock you turn over will have your two rupees, which is your day's wage. You can't pick up two rocks and get four rupees, but it'll be any rock you pick up. So they go home and they pick up the rocks, and they all got to expect this. This is the guru, you know, this is... See, in India, this can happen. Here, it's already suspicious. <laughs> so, but India is changing. So, finally, the a local um, magistrate and his <coughs> lieutenant come, and they say to Nityananda, we're very concerned. We hear somebody is uh, making money here, counterfeiting. Nityananda said, oh, no. Yes, because your workmen all have these new, fresh bills. And we wonder, could you tell us where, you, where they're coming from? Nityananda says, oh, of course. And he wallows off into the woods, and they follow after him, and he goes to a lake. And in the lake are crocodiles. And he calls a crocodile, and the crocodile comes over, and he opens the crocodile's mouth, and he starts pulling bills out of it. <laughs> and the policeman fled. So, but India is changing. So finally, the a local um, magistrate and his <coughs> lieutenant come, and they say to Nityananda, "We are very concerned. We hear somebody is uh, making money here, counterfeiting." Nityananda said, "Oh no! Yes, because your workmen all have these new, fresh bills." And we wonder, could you tell us where you where they're coming from? Nityananda says, oh, of course, and he wallows off into the woods, and they follow after him, and he goes to a lake, and in the lake are crocodiles, and he calls a crocodile, and the crocodile comes over, and he opens the crocodile's mouth, and he starts pulling bills out of it, <laughs> and the policeman fled. <laughs> now, I wasn't there. <laughs> However, to me, I can allow that. Okay? So I had this great meeting with... Um, Feynman, you know the Nobel Prize winner physicist, he's died, but he's a beautiful, beautiful far out man. And I was telling him miracle stories. I was telling him about my guru and all the stuff that I've published in Miracle of Love. And each one I'd tell him, and we were sitting at John Lilly's swimming pool, and each one I'd tell him, he'd think for a while, he'd say, yes, I can accept that. Good. And I'd tell him a more outrageous one. Yes, I can accept that. So finally I told him this one where Maharaji was in Allahabad and the people from Kampur said, we are unveiling the new Hanuman Murti tomorrow, Maharaji, please come. And he says, no, I have no time for that. I'm not going to go. So they all went home disappointed. And the next morning, Maharaji's in Allahabad, he asked to be put in a room in his bedroom. He says, now lock the doors and stand guard. I don't want to be bothered. I have business to attend to. So they lock him in the room, and there's bars on the windows and the whole thing. And then at noon, he screams to open the door, and he comes out, and the day goes on. And late that evening, the people from Kampur arrive. And the people from Allahabad say to the people from Kampur, how was the... Um, Unveiling, they said, oh, it was wonderful. And the people from Allahabad said, how could it be wonderful if Maharaji wasn't there? They said, don't be silly, he was there. That he arrived and we honored him and fed him and he was there and he said he was there for quite a while and then he said, don't follow me and he left and he went into the woods. So both the Allahabad and the Kampur people came before Maharaji. The Allahabad man said, Maharaji, we locked you in that room, and the Kampum men started to tell that story, and Maharaji looked at the Kampum men and said, you're a liar, get him out of here, he lies. Now, he didn't lie. Maharaji would just do this thing with smoke and mirrors all the time, you know, you can't believe that, he'd leave you always confused. So Feynman thought about that, he says, no. 
He said, I can't accept that. That means he's in two places at the same moment. If I accept that, the basic assumptions of my whole system are out the window. I'm sorry, I can't accept that. I said, well, you have a problem. This is part of what the East and West issue is, by the way. I mean, I'm playing with it from a lot of different levels to deal with it. And what has, it's interesting, I was just thinking about, um, recently I was with uh, Johnny Kabat-Zinn, whom I really admire a great deal. I think he's done some really brilliant and fine work, as has Herb Benson. <clears throat> but I, you know, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking how interesting that meditation makes its Theravada in Buddhism, makes its way into the system through symptom alleviation. I mean, can you hear that? That's the way that's coming in. In other words, our society is very much still what it was, you know, and the interesting question is how much you, or to watch how you adapt it into the system and what is lost or what is gained in it. Like, um, some of the groups that have come from India with, or, or uh, studying Tibetan Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, or um, Zen groups, have remained extremely rigid in order to hold on to their lineage. Because they realized that was their lifeline to the truth. And that was what they felt empowered to transmit. And in order to transmit that, they were of the traditional system where to transmit it, you keep the system as purely defined as you can for that transmission to occur. And I have honored these lineages tremendously. I mean, I really have honored them and I've done lots of benefits for them because it feels to me that it's a tremendous richness that comes into the West if these come in in their purest forms. Now, there has been a lot of movement in our society to, to say they're all one. But you, there's a timing issue involved in that. It's the issue of diversity, actually. Like I was, um, we had a retreat for burned out social activists. Um, the Seva Foundation had this retreat. And um, the first day, uh, Paul Gorman and I were basically leading this retreat. And the first night I was going to speak, but what happened was the, uh, the um, people of color got together and they decided what is this bullshit that these two white men are leading this scene and we are, and it be turned into a pitch battle and the whole program was canceled. I mean, we all stayed there, but the format was canceled and for a day there were just these incredible power meetings and caucuses and everything. And at one point, I made the mistake <laughs> of saying, well, we're all one. And one of the really beautiful women said, don't give us that bullshit. <laughs> now, for yogis, you, you all hear that <laughs> and appreciate the problem. <laughs> and what it reminded me of was a story that Zalman Schachter told me about Shlomo Kalbach. He said that Shlomo was in uh, Jerusalem to give a concert in a prison and he asked only the Jewish people in the prison came and he asked where the Muslims were and he was told that they weren't coming. And so he said he was going over to the Muslim side or something like that. And he started to be there with them and sing and play his guitar and his... And one woman, he found out, had lost her son in battle. And so he did the Kaddish with her. And 
that so opened the heart. It, it, they met through the heart. And at that point, Zalman said, he said, you know, he said, before we can be together, we have to grieve with one another. We have to grieve with one another. And it was interesting because what we did at this retreat for burned out activists was we created a fishbowl and then every segment that felt that it was wrong had a chance to come into the center and express to each other what that felt like to be black, to be gay, to be white males. White males came in as a group because they felt put upon for their chauvinistic pigness. <laughs> and it was interesting, that took maybe two days. And by the la end of the retreat, we were so together as a group. The unity was so deep because everybody felt heard. Everybody felt heard, felt listened to. One of the big issues that um, I see is a distinction between cultures which focus on personality and cultures which focus on role. Like there was this young guy in the village that I spend time in in India whose marriage, he was about 23, his marriage had been arranged by the local astrologer between his parents and the girl's parents. He had never met the girl. He would meet her for about 10 minutes before the marriage. They would be married with masks of Radha and Krishna. And I said to him, and then they would move into his father's home and he would work in his father's hotel business and the, his daughter, the, his wife would serve his mother, say goodbye to her family. And this was, and I said, is this bothering you? I said, what if you don't like her? And he didn't know what I was talking about. Now, can you in this culture imagine that? He didn't know what I was talking about. In this culture of what do I need, what do I want, am I getting it, am I getting enough, how can I get more? I got it, but it doesn't feel good. <laughs> I taught, um, I was teaching in Japan last year and I was doing a retreat at Mount Fuji. And it was incredible. I mean, I must honor the Japanese. They have rolled down to perfection. You say, sing Kirtan, they sing Kirtan. They don't ask, can I sing? Should I sing? Is it my thing to sing? They sing. <laughs> you say, dance, they dance. You say, get enlightened, they get enlightened. I mean, it's a no bullshit operation. <laughs> I'm a great appreciator of role identities because I think the game is to move in and out of roles so lightly without basically identifying with role. Am I talking too long? It's 25 of 10. What do you want me to do? Shall I, I was supposed to stop at 9.30. Would somebody in a, in a power tell me what to do? I can go on for a few moments. I think he said 10 minutes. He, I think it wasn't stop, it was 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, one of the most interesting connections that I have at the moment, or have had in the past uh, 15 years, is uh, Dr. Venkateswamy. And Dr. Venkateswamy is um, he's a man from Madurai, India, and. Um, in his youth, he was trained to be a gynecologist, and then he was in the army and during the war, and he got severely arthritically crippled so that they never thought he'd walk again, and his hands are all gnarled like this, and his feet are gnarled. And um, it was incredible arthritis, and he was in his 20s. 
And then he w just <clears throat> got back, but he saw he couldn't be a gynecologist very well. So he became an eye surgeon. <laughs> and he had special instruments made for his hands, and he performed very delicate eye surgery. And he was a professor of ophthalmology. And then he retired, and in um, 1972, I guess, maybe 6, 72 or so, he started a small clinic with about 24 beds in it. And now, in 1995, it is the uh, biggest eye hospital in the world. Biggest eye hospital. They do 80,000 cataract surgeries a year in that hospital. And in that hospital, 70% of the patients are treated free, paid for by the other 30% who get a better bedroom. Now, what's interesting about this story, I'm not just giving you a rap for giving money to Seva, is because Dr. Venkateswamy is a very powerful devotee of Sri Aurobindo, Sri Aurobindo and the mother. I'm sure you're familiar with those names. And in Sri Aurobindo's um, cosmology, which he has written <laughs> extensively about, <laughs> um, one goes through in the transformation of consciousness through different levels of mind and uh, he articulates a number of the planes of consciousness, which I told you we were going to reduce to three, but he has lots of them. And you get up into the overmind, and it gets really heady out there. And then what happens is, the higher energy, as you get out of the way, the higher energy starts to come down through you, out through you, and it manifests in terms of spiritualizing Earth. It's like uh, tikkun olem in, in Judaism, basically. It's, it's transforming, bringing the spirit into life. And he is, his whole, all he does is read Aurobindo and the mother, meditate, and run this thing, which has now become so big that he now, he's, big, he's been honored by everybody for everything. And it's now, um, I'll give you one tasty little example. Are you still here or is it too pushing? It's not as joyous, but you're still here. <laughs> you got a big week, weekend coming up, so I won't try. But listen to this one. In India, when you have your cataract taken out, in the United States, when you have it taken out, they take a little plastic thing and they slip it in, which is another lens. And then if you had lousy vision, you have 20-20 vision. So after cataract surgery, they put in what's called an intraocular lens. Okay. This is a little plastic thing that's shaped just perfectly. And in the United States, it costs about $280 for lens. So when the pharmaceutical companies here have uh, lenses, they've got new models or something like that, they give away the old ones as a tax write-off. So we take all those and we take them to India, all right, as a tax thing. And, but when we take them to the hospital, even though the hospital has 70% poor and 30% paying, generally what happens, not only in that hospital but all over India, is that the rich people get the lenses. Okay? Because the option to getting the lens is to get these thick, opaque glasses that look like the bottom of old Coca-Cola bottles, you know the really thick ones? So, in the past four years, we have built an intraocular lens eye factory in Madurai, India, that makes the same quality of lenses as are made in the United States. In fact, it's a United States operation, a turnkey operation that we just moved over there, basically makes them for six dollars a lens. And they're only made for non-profits, so now the poor people get the lenses as well. Okay. Now, what we've got is 
Dr. V kept saying, you know, I don't understand why we shouldn't take on all preventable and curable blindness in the world. You know, like Africa and, you know, Tibet, where, everywhere. He said, you know, in the United States, it's amazing. You have everywhere you're within walking distance of a hamburger. Why can't medical care be provided like that? He says it's only a, fran it's a franchising opera. He says it's, <laughs> it's just a, a thing. He said, I want to meet the head of McDonald's. <laughs> he said, we should be able to do this like McDonald's does it. So now he's got the Lions International have given him a million dollars for an international training institute. The World Bank's put up 40 million for changing India with him as the head consultant. I mean, and as far as he's concerned, Aurobindo is doing this incredible trip. And the fact is, that's the way it is. <laughs> it really is interesting. And I'm one of the few people that he can hang out with that isn't caught in the storyline. And that's just enjoying the way the energy is moving in the system. I'll cut to my chase so I can, you can get home. Oh God, all this wonderful stuff you're not going to hear. Oh, Jesus, that, that was particularly good. <laughs> Well, what the hell? Huh. I didn't have anything good. You knew it all anyway. <laughs> I would like to just say to you, since there are here many teachers, that the art of teaching is the work you do on yourself. And that if you understand that cycle well enough, what I began to see was that everything I tried to do, to the extent that it had in it attachments in my mind, that I was not simultaneously aware of, everything that I tried to do that way in some level or other created suffering. With, and I did it from as good a righteous place as I could do it. That was what was so weird about it. And I saw that I had to work on myself. Take being with somebody that's dying. I mean, at one level, it's somebody that's dying. At another level, it isn't. How much do you get caught in their somebody that's dyingness? And if your mind gets caught in that, so that becomes the dominant reality, that's all you're offering that person a mirror for that reality and you're keeping them stuck in that thing and you realize finally that what you want to do is work on yourself to become an environment to allow other beings to do what they need to do how presumptuous of me to think I know how somebody should die but I can create an environment where if they want to come out and play there's nothing in me that's going to keep them stuck inside. They can stay there if they want to, but they don't have to. So I realize that I have a, a lot of work to do on myself. I'm not, it's not a heavy thing, it's quite light. It is the best work, I mean, if I were going to say anything at the beginning of fellow yogis, aren't we lucky? Aren't we lucky to realize the predicament we're in? To realize who we are and what the possibility is. I mean, this group, if none other, But what I see is this circle, that I use everything I'm doing in my life as a vehicle to work on myself, including this moment. I work on myself as an offering to others so that I can become an instrument that does not create more suffering. So I use this to work on myself, I work on myself as an offering to this. So what this is, what I offer you, is the product of what I have been doing on myself. And you can feel in you places I'm stuck, places you're stuck, etc. All I want to do is invite you to keep the dialogue open about who you are and what you think you're doing. Keep it open, 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 and listen, listen, listen. 
because that's my optimum strategy. And what I do is I surround people who bust me, who bust me, who show me when I got out of hand because it's hard not to sip your own whiskey. You know, enough people tell you you're real. If there's any need in you to be real that way, you buy that projection web. And, and you've got to be able to walk through the projective field of, oh, you're so wonderful, or you're, you've done this terrible thing to our youth through drugs, or whatever the projection is that's coming at you. Because they're coming at you all the time. I mean, everybody you know thinks you're somebody. And they're all like Typhoid Mary. <laughs> it's really bizarre. We keep locking into, well, I'm good, and I'm on the spiritual path. It's like Lot's wife, you know. Like, no. I was going around a circle of elders and I said to one woman, what are you, what are you doing here? She says, I'm a seeker. I said, why don't you be a finder? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, that's it, my 10 minutes is up. Let me look for a closing. <laughs> oh. Okay, let me just get a straight closing. I didn't give you all the really good stuff I should have given you, but that's all right, you'll forgive me. Because really what I'm doing is I'm saying I'm a Westerner who went to the East, who tasted something so rich and so pure, it bugs the shit out of me when I see it being sold without the true guarantee of the thing behind it. And I think that if you are sellers of Dharma, you damn well better be Dharmic. And it's really, you know, it's hard. It's hard. Because what happened was we touched something very pure. And it's just like that story of God and Satan walking down the street. And there's a shiny object and God picks it up and he says, ah, truth. And Satan says, here, give it to me, I'll organize it. <laughs> and you watch. You watch what the mind does to the stuff. And I've watched yogic practices that have the potential of deep transformation in human beings being marketed as something so much less than that. Being marketed as something that'll make you healthy and wealthy and wise, but not free. And I'll tell you, the only game in town is becoming free. And don't confuse internal freedom and external freedom. External freedom is just external freedom. You want it for other people. For you, you take what you get. But the game is internal freedom. Not getting high, but being free. There is no playing you cannot stand on. You have to realize there is nowhere to stand in freedom. You're everywhere all at once. You're in your human heart with all its pain and all of its grief and all of its joy. You're in the mind with a brilliant intellect. I'm just going on the internet now. And I'm looking at all this information and oh God, it's just ah. But it's another plane of consciousness. And it's a plane we can dance with. We don't have to say that's all we are, but we can learn how to dance in that form as well. Learning how the, the oh, can I have two more, three more? <laughs> We can just have hmm. No. Yeah. No, yeah. No, I want to stay just with the I came back from India and I couldn't tell people about my guru. Because the, their most reaction was either scorn or belittling or jealousy. And I felt like I was creating suffering just by telling them about this gift that I had received. And that felt really weird to me. Because the, in the West, the minute we hear about something tasty, we want to possess it. I, the bigger the thing I was going to tell you about is about the Gita. The Gita's injunction 
to not be identified with being the actor and not being attached to the fruits of the action is such a profound teaching. Because you say, well, what else is there? If you're in the West, that's what you'd say. What else is there? I mean, isn't the West all about being identified with being the actor and being attached to the fruits of the action? It is as far as I can see. You say, well, what else is there? There is Dharma. There is you are quiet enough to tune deeply enough to hear exactly to allow the manifestation to come forth. It's nothing personal. <laughs> You're not that personal. Don't make it such a personal story. It's not that interesting. It's not that interesting. What you start to do is like the Tao. You begin to feel your way into the harmony of things. You feel, well, if I have this skill, I'll use it this way. If I can sing, I'll sing. If I can massage, I will massage. If I can... But never are you forgetting what Amanda Mai's Ma said. I did all this stuff, but basically, this was all my dialogue with my beloved. It's all the dialogue with the beloved. It's making love. The whole process of sadhana and of living... To me, my entire life is my sadhana. And in each situation, it is to listen to hear the Dharma, not with a heavy, well, what's the Dharma here? Just to shut up and listen and tune and to find your form. Find the form. And how it comes out is how it comes out. I visit somebody and afterwards they say, a great saint visited us. I visit somebody else and they say, he came and, you know, I expected so much and nothing happened. It was a real waste. To me, that's just the play of God. It's none of, I did it as well as I could do it. That was the Dharma part of it. Now, did I do it? I work with that line, one does nothing and nothing is left undone. It's a line from the Tao, it is a beauty. That solves burnout, just that one line. That's as good as the line as Emmanuel's line of what's about death, tell everybody it's absolutely safe. <laughs> and that's an exquisite one-liner. He said it's like taking off a tight shoe. So okay, have a great yoga conference and I just suggest to you that you and I are carrying something very beautiful and very precious. And we know that because we've each tasted and touched something. And to me, my life, I don't know what else life is about once you've tasted that, than to become an instrument of yoga, an instrument of union, an instrument of transcendence, an instrument one of being non-attachment in the presence of attachment in the way that others can find freedom through you. I honor you all and wish you a happy weekend. Namaste. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.